It's a great pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I'd also like to pay tribute to the Honourable Member for Redditch for making a very powerful speech and securing a debate on such an important subject, and also to my friends the Honourable Member for Walsall North and the Honourable Member for Strangford, who both of whom have been really strong supporters of the entire project of engaging with prisoners and offender reform in many, many debates in this place and in the main chamber. In essence, Mr. Betts, we're dealing here with a classic issue of public policy, something where the objective, the target, is really a big prize. If we can get prisoners, if we can get prisoners into education and through education into employment, they are less likely to offend and there will be fewer victims and the public will be safer and their lives will be turned around. The problem, Mr. Betts, is that it's a classic issue of public policy because it's something that's very easy to talk about, but it's very difficult to do very much about. The problem with this debate is that almost any time in the last 175 years, you would have heard ministers standing up talking about prison reform. And despite 175 years of ministers talking about prison reform and investing in education in prisons, we are still in a situation where only 20% of prisoners get a job on release. And that's been pretty static for decades. About a fifth of people coming into prison have a job, about a fifth of people leaving prison have a job. So what is the answer to this problem? And clearly, it's not a question of silver bullets. So Herbert Gladstone, 1895, stood up, gave a great speech in this house, in which he stood up in a language which I can't hope to emulate, said, prison discipline and treatment should be more effectually designed to maintain, stimulate, or awaken the higher susceptibilities of prisoners to develop their moral instincts, to train them in orderly and industrial habits, and whenever possible, to turn them out of prison better men and women, both physically and morally, than when they came in. So that's over 120 years ago. Very difficult to disagree with the basic expression of what we've been trying to do in this country for a very long time. What are the problems? Well, the first problem, uh, to be really realistic about it, is a problem that was touched on by the Honourable Member from Walsall North, is that many prisoners come from very different, difficult backgrounds. So as we've heard, perhaps a quarter of them come out of care, Nearly a third of prisoners have serious alcohol addiction issues. Another third have serious drug addiction issues. Perhaps a half of prisoners have a reading age of under 11. A significant number of prisoners have a reading age of under 6. Nearly 40% of our prisoners have been excluded from school from one time or another. So just to fast forward from the rhetoric around education and employment to the reality, you need to imagine yourself in Pentonville, as I was today, looking at a classroom, Midsummer, very, very hot, small room, five men sitting there uh, with a single teacher, and these are people who have never found it easy to go to school, never found it easy to listen to a teacher. And of those five men, they'll be at very different educational levels. One of them will be unable to read and write. The other one will be bored because he's in for, uh, for theft, but in fact can already read and write and doesn't really understand why he's in the class. And there will be a general sense that everybody's rotating through. Maybe Pentonville. Average day, 45, 50 new prisoners turn up a day, and 45, 50 prisoners are going out of that prison every day. So it's very, very difficult dealing with this. And solving the problem, Mr. Betts, is not a question of making grand statements about the human soul, because as I said, Mr. Gladstone made much better statements about that in 1895 than I'm able to today. It's about understanding exactly what's going wrong in that prisoner's journey step by step. So what is going wrong in that prisoner's journey step by step? The first thing is you need to recognize the type of prison that that prisoner's in. Is it a reception prison in which they're coming in for a very short period straight out of the courts or on remand? Or is it a prison where they're likely to spend six months, 12 months, two years of their life, in which case you can deliver a very different kind of education provision? Secondly, are the kind of qualifications you get in prison A the same as the qualifications you get in prison B and ultimately prison C and D? You could move through four prisons in the course of your career too often as a prisoner, if you follow that course, you'll be pursuing a city and guilds qualification in prison A, you turn up to prison B and the city and guilds qualification is not even available. In fact, even more fundamentally, the core common curriculum might not be available. So you might not be able to even get English, maths, ICT. Add to that 
the governor frequently does not feel genuinely empowered to control that person's life. The governor doesn't necessarily feel they really have the leverage or the flexibility to say to the education provider what really matters in this area is bricklaying or we have a real shortage of people in scaffolding. I want you to provide scaffolding training. They don't feel they would get rewarded for that. They don't feel that they would get promoted for that. So what are we really trying to do in the education employment strategy? We're trying to deal with those kinds of very practical issues. First thing that we've done is we've introduced a common core curriculum which will ensure right the way through the prison service that every single prison that you go to, regardless of where it is, which part of the country you're in, how long you go in there, will deliver that core curriculum. English, maths, ICT, and for people who don't speak English, English as a foreign language. Secondly, we're making sure that the qualifications that you get are the same in these prisons. Now, a lot of this, again, sounds pretty simple to say, Mr. Betts, but in fact it is the complex and strange world of government procurement. So you end up in a whole series of conversations about dynamic purchasing systems. We've ended up with 12 preferred suppliers for the core common curriculum, 300 suppliers for the additional work. We've got 17 core groups bidding into them with a selected list, short list of five for each area. What does this mean? What does it mean? It means in the end, imagine you're Yorkshire. Imagine, Mr. Betts, that you are the prison group director for Yorkshire. Get together your six prisons. You would have five people on a short list. Could be Milton Keynes College. Could be, uh, for example, Novus bidding for you. You look at them, 80% of the score will be done on your judgment with your prison governors of which is going to provide the best quality of education. 20% of that will be done on the cost of the provision. I hand over to the member for Redditch. Thank you so very much taking a, a brief intervention and I absolutely welcome what he's saying and it's heartening to hear how much progress has been made. I wonder if he would enlighten us on the role of volunteers who go into prisons and offer their time freely because they believe in the cause of helping prisoners rebuild their lives. For example, my own son, while at university, attended a, uh, a course at a nearby prison where he was he's an English literature student and he went to a nearby prison and taught prisoners Shakespeare. He said that was the most profound experience that he'd ever had. And I think the feedback was also that the prisoners got something out of it as well. But clearly there's a vast spectrum of this sort of activity. And I very much hope that what he's doing won't crowd out this kind of activity as well. C can you enlighten us on that? Absolutely. So, Mr. Betts, just, just to, to put this in context. So, imagine you're the Yorkshire Group Director. You get your governors around to your five list of five. You choose the supplier who you think is going to provide the best quality of your core common curriculum. And then you adjust for your area. How do you adjust for your area? So, if you are, for example, a training prison like Humber, currently Humber is offering coding. It's offering upholstery. It's offering design services to other prisons. Lindholm, for example, again in Yorkshire, will be focusing on construction skills. And then, as the Honourable Member for Redditch has pointed out, you need to be open to bolting onto that education the incredible offerings of other types of volunteers. I myself taught uh, Shakespeare, in fact, in prisons uh, when I was an undergraduate, so I can relate to what your son has been doing. You need to provide the space for all these voluntary organisations to be able to come into your prison and you need to be able to run that core common prison day to have the regime right so you can actually get the prisoners into the classroom. I'm going to give way to the Honourable Member Stratford. Thank you, Minister, for, for responding. Minister, in, in your uh, response to the Honourable Lady's uh, uh, submission as, as put forward, you referred to the, the um, educational quality of some of those who, who you're looking at. Can I just say that, 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 that all the things that you said are right, but there are some of those people are at a level, I have to say, where they need probably daily living skills, they need budgeting skills, they need uh, how, to how to live skills. I'm just wondering, how, do you incorporate those sort of skills into the very basics of life? The core to the answer to this must be giving the governor the freedom and the responsibility to be able to adjust to the prisoners within that prison and to really take responsibility for that. So one of the big changes in this framework is we've taken the power out of the centre, we've given it down to the governor, so the governor would do exactly that. And how are governors doing that? Increasingly, the answer to that is that the way that you teach the numeracy skills, the literacy skills, the budgeting skills, is through the upholstery course, is through the carpentry course, is through the construction course. Frequently, the best way to get people to learn those things is to focus on the practical vocational skills and attach 
those life skills, the vocational skills that you're delivering. Again in Yorkshire, I just want to pursue this Yorkshire example a bit further, the New Futures Network has now been set up. This exists exactly to get somebody with the prison group director to connect directly to the employers. So to make sure they're reaching out to an employer's board and make sure the employers understand what's an offer in the prison. In addition, I'd like to pay tribute not just to Paul Fowether, who's the prison group director in Yorkshire, but while I'm pursuing the Yorkshire example, an organization like Tempus Novo, the honorable member for Redditch, asked about voluntary organizations. Tempus Novo is a charity run by two terrific ex-prison officers. These are people who spent 25 years working on the landings. They left as band four officers, so, so not, not governing grade officers. And they set up an organization where they will walk with employers into the prison, introduce them to the prisoners, reassure the employers about what's involved in employing an offender, and then go into the workplace with the offender for the first interview. Any problems that emerge in the workplace, Tempest Nova will then follow up with them. In other words, Mr. Betts, this business of education employment for prisoners isn't in the end about big ideas. It's not about fancy strategies. It's about doing 50 or 60 things well, looking very carefully at the quality of what we're delivering, speaking to prison governors, speaking to prisoners. What's going wrong with the curriculum? How many hours a day are you able to spend in the classroom? Is the fan working on the classroom? Are the teachers actually turning up? Is that qualification that you got of any use in the outside world? Yes, you're beginning to go on an apprenticeship scheme, but are you able to actually connect that to the government system? Yes, you're learning how to do abseiling, but are you able to get the health and safety support to be able to turn that into you being able to be a window cleaner on a high altitude building? What are we doing with release on temporary license? This was a question for the Honourable Member for Redditch to make sure that we actually give people the chance to spend time in an employer's workplace before they leave prison formally. And changing that again is about changing a dozen small rules, making sure that you don't have a statutory lie-down period in each new prison you go to so that I'm released on temporary license in this prison, I move to another prison, Mr. Betts, and suddenly I have to sit back in the prison again and I lose touch with my workplace. If we can get all these things right, and it will be hard yards, we can make a real difference. When I talk about hard yards, talking about making a difference, at the moment, only 20% of prisoners leaving prison get a job. If we could get it up to 25, 30%, it would be fantastic. It would change nearly 40 years of stagnation in this period. And remember, that doesn't sound like big numbers, but we've got nearly 200,000 people circling through our criminal justice system every year. Every one of those people we get into a job is 7% less likely to reoffend. And what does that translate into? That translates not just into tens of thousands of families now with an income and somebody at home who's got a job, but it's thousands of less crimes committed. It's thousands of less victims of crime coming out of the end. It's a society that's healthier. It's a society that's safer. And at the core of this is our belief in the capacity for humans to change, our belief in our incredibly hard-working <coughs> prison officers, in our governors, in our prison group directors who are driving through this change, in the employers who are often taking, like Timpsons, a huge risk, but also putting a lot of energy into understanding prisoners and their needs and the kind of skills they need to stand eight hours a day on the shop floor dealing with the customer. If we can get all these things right, then I think we can be proud not just of our criminal justice system, not just of our education strategy, but also of our society. Thank you very much indeed.